<laughs> there you yep. go. It's recording. There it is. And we are now live. So participants have started to enter the zoo. So Ethan, you know everybody. Hey, hey, Karen. So you don't manually let people in. They just roll in now, right? Correct. Yeah. Anybody gotcha. who's signed up is now. Uh, they it. were they were waiting basically for me to let them in. Got it. That's like Welcome a pretty. Everybody. Yeah, I see the number getting up there. That's right. So, Andy, do we get to talk about um, about our own uh, uh, forest management exercises? What What do you mean? Yeah, like like the, uh, the we just had on ours. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. I, I get up there every chance I get. I walk up through that area that we we had yeah. the, the harvest on. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, there's that one stone wall that goes from the Jeep trail up to the top of the first um, knoll there. Yeah. So what I've done is I've uh, along that stone wall, I've opened that up. Originally, the plan was to make it a Jeep trail. But as I was cutting the stuff to make that the trail up there, I found uh, all these little uh, oak and maple trees that are that are popping up. Ah, right, cool. So I'm thinking I don't want to drive up there with those things. People can walk up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, get, you can get a good vista from the top there. You can see a long ways from up there. Yeah, yeah. So I've gotten yeah, to the top. Now I just have to figure out where I'm going to go from there. I'll, I'll look at that this weekend. Very cool. Very cool. Did uh? It's, it's so neat because I was I would sit on a rock on the wall, and I would look like but ten feet around on you know 180 degrees there would be ten to fifteen little oak trees popping up. I just that's so great to see that. That's encouraging. Yeah, that's cool. Um, by the way, I, I, I hope it's okay. I, I told Jeremy Caggiano to call you because he has a young man who would like to um, shadow him for a day or two in the summer who's going to be going to Paul Smith's next year. Okay. Um, and I told him to call you. I'm going to take him to my family property one morning, and I think he's going to try to connect with you and and go do a, a tour over there at the same time so i told him just to call you and see yeah, if you no could problem. meet him or whatever as long as i'm there we're okay yeah okay so i'm just going to give us one more minute and then we can go ahead and get started um before we get started i'll just uh make a few housekeeping notes um anybody who has questions during the presentation for ethan they can go ahead and put those in the q a section of the Zoom, that Q&A should be in that menu bar, either, either along the top or the bottom of your screen. And we'll get to those questions at the end of the session. We should have time at the end to answer any questions you might have. Um, other than that, you can also feel free to use the chat. And um, I think that we can go ahead and get started. So um, my name is Kieran Hunt. I'm filling in for Lori, Lori Jensen today. She couldn't be here. I'm a director with uh, the Forestry Association, and I'm going to introduce to you Andy Kim, our president. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. We have another wonderful presentation on tap for tonight, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from Ethan. So uh, I got a couple couple things to go over, as I always do every uh, every month. Um, so we'll move right along with that, and then get into our our uh, presentation. Uh, as we know, the Backyard Forestry uh, program is every third Thursday of the month. Uh, so you, know, you might want to mark on your calendar, you know, when you hit the third Thursday, we've got Backyard Forestry at seven o'clock. Uh, we have uh, originally this was done in person, uh, but now because of the pandemic for the last two years, we've been able to do this um, remotely. And it's turned out to be very good because actually we, uh, we actually get, can get better participation this way. So. Save the third Thursday of every month, and uh, in advance you'll be hearing uh, what, what the particular topic will be, and you'll be able to sign up for it. So uh, why join the New Jersey Forestry Association? Well, you can see the list of the things that we do here. Uh, we have our newsletter that comes out quarterly. We have our website. Annual meeting, which has been a little tough to hold uh, the last couple of years. We did have a couple of remote annual meetings the last two years. Uh, New Jersey Woodland Stewards Program, which is a three and a half day uh, intense uh, get into the, the camping mode where you spend uh, half your time in the woods and half the time going through uh, 
uh, debriefing sessions. Um, not been able to do that again the last couple of years. We're hoping to get back to the regular one this year in September. Uh, Backyard Forestry in 90 Minutes, of course, is this situation. Uh, we said we do this the third Thursday of every month. Uh, Landover rep representation, uh, that is the biggest thing that we do. That's where we came from. Uh, we've been doing this for about 50 years. We represent the special interests of uh, woodland owners primarily, but uh, we also have non-woodland owners who are interested in, in learning, such as the backyard forestry stuff. And the other thing we do is we monitor legislation that, uh, that could be affecting um, forestry, forest woodlands in New Jersey. Uh, a couple of things going on right now, very important that uh, we're involved with. So that's a big part of what we do as well. So with that, I will introduce uh, Andy Bennett, who is a consulting forester and another director in the New Jersey Forestry Association. And Andy will be introducing our special speaker for this month. All right, well, Andy Kim probably doesn't even know he did this, but he said, we've got a great program on tap. I don't know if that was intentional, but our speaker is named. <laughs> that was pretty, pretty <laughs> slick, man. <laughs> so, Hey, uh, thanks again, everybody, for, for joining us tonight. Um, we're in for a real treat. Uh, it's my, my pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Ethan Tapper. So I've got a quick little bio to read. Ethan is the Chittenden County Forester for the Vermont Department of Forest, Parks, and Rec. Uh, Ethan advises private landowners, municipalities, conservation organizations, foresters, and loggers on the responsible stewardship of forest land administers, he helps administer Vermont's use value appraisal program in the county and manages over 4,000 acres of community forests. He writes a monthly column for 11 community newspapers and a quarterly column in Northern Woodlands Magazine. He maintains a YouTube channel, leads dozens of public events attended by thousands of people each year and manages his own 175 acre forest he calls Bear Island in Bolton, Vermont. Uh, Ethan's the 2020 recipient of Vermont Covert's James B. Engel Award, the Northeast Midwest State Foresters Alliance's 2021 CFM Forester of the Year, the 2021 recipient of American Tree Farm Systems Education and Outreach Award, and the 2022 recipient of Vermont, the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program's Vermont Tree Steward Award. So all that to say is Ethan is, is an accomplished guy. Um, he's very well respected. And uh, he is, um, he's a great author, great, great writer, very thought provoking. And I think we're going to really, really benefit from his presentation tonight. And I just want to say, Ethan, thanks for taking time to be with us. I know there's probably a thousand other things you could be doing, other places you could be, you could be out at Bear Island doing something cool. So um, we, we really are grateful you take time to be with us. So with that, you, it's all yours, man. Thank you. Great. So thanks for having me. And I'm really just so happy to be here and going to be speaking to all of you. Um, yeah, so, so my name is Ethan Tapper. I'm the Chittenden County Forester here in Vermont. The County Forester Program is it's basically about how do we help private landowners manage their land responsibly. And like most of the Eastern United States, you know, about 80% of our forested land is owned by private landowners. And so we have this incredibly huge vested interest, all of us, right, in making sure that those lands are managed responsibly. We say that private lands produce public benefits, meaning that these 80% of land of forests that are owned by private landowners are producing the vast majority of all of these public benefits that we all enjoy. So stuff like clean air and clean water, pollination services, carbon sequestration and storage, um, scenic beauty, you know, and, and, and many other things. So it's really important that we manage them well. And there's 13 of us from Vermont's 14 counties. And I am just one of them. And there's a lot of other ones that are pretty great. So anyway, so I'm going to share with you a presentation that I've called in the past the Radical Forest Manager. Today, I'm calling it uh, Forestry for a Changed and a Changing World. And it's basically just sort of an exploration of, of a different way of thinking about forests and our relationship to forest uh, in light of where and who we are. So with that, I'm going to start sharing my screen. And I will kick us off in just a moment here.
All right, how are we looking, Andy? Uh, you're good, man. All right. So Forestry for a Change and Changing World, um, that's my name. That's who I work for, the state of Vermont. Uh, that's my email address if anybody has, has questions or, or wants to engage uh, in conversation after this. And so really, you know, the, the, first, the first thing that I think we need to think about, I'm just gonna adjust my view here. The first thing that is really important to think about as we think about how we take care of our forests is, is what forests are. So I, I call this process reimagining forests. And this has actually been a, a process for me personally is, is thinking about, you know, what is a forest? And, and let's start from there. And if we're gonna treat our forests and our other ecosystems better, um, this requires a little bit of, of redefinition. So what's a forest, right? A forest is a place with a bunch of trees in it. And that's the definition that you'll see if you look up any definition anywhere. Very simple, you know when you're in a forest, right? Because you're in a place with trees. I think about a forest as something a little bit different. And this is a definition from this amazing book about Vermont's natural communities called Wetland, Woodland, Wildland by Liz Thompson, Eric Sorensen. They define a, a natural community in this case as an interacting assemblage of organisms, their physical environment and the natural processes that affect them. So if we wanna take care of trees, we can just think about a forest as trees, but really if we wanna take care of the totality of what a forest is, we need to broaden our definition exponentially. So I think of the trees in a forest like the coral in a coral reef. They're this living structure around which this community is built. But if we were thinking about a coral reef, we would never just think about the coral, right? We would think about this whole swirling, expansive, diverse volume of life. And that's what a forest really is. Uh, a forest is not a condition. It is not static. It is a community which is engaged in this incredibly exciting, at times slow moving, but exciting and dynamic process. And it includes many other things besides trees. So when I think about a forest, I think about all of those different pieces, the, the trees and the plants and the animals and the birds and the mosses and the lichens and the bryophytes and the invertebrates, all of those things to me are the forest. And as we delve more into the science of forest ecology, what we understand is that all of those pieces and parts are not just interesting or important just because they are, you know, and they are, I believe that they have intrinsic importance as well, but they also have these really important roles to play in keeping forests healthy and keeping each other healthy. So every presentation that I do, I have some kind of a slide like this and, and the following one. As we reimagine what forests are, it's really important that uh, we understand what they're supposed to look like. And for some reason embedded within all of us is this idea that forests are supposed to look like this. These big evenly spaced trees, nothing growing in the understory. Uh, and the reality is that this has much more to do with our sense of aesthetics than it probably has to do with the way that forests manage themselves and the way that old growth forests look, for instance. What forests really look like is this. This is what old forests look like. This is what healthy forests look like. Um, if you ask any ecologist, they'll tell you that healthy forests are defined not by their uniformity and by their neatness and tidiness, but actually by their messiness. Um, it's really important that we understand this because in my, you know, working with many hundreds of people and talking to many thousands more, well, I've, I've just realized that this idea, this, this false idea that uh, a forest is supposed to look nice to us, you know, intuitively, is just really, um, really drives people's perceptions about what forests are and then, and then what forest, how forest stewardship is judged. Um, I think that if, if you feel that way, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just that a sense and a vision of what a healthy forest looks like is not something any of us are born with. It's something that we need to develop. And actually a great inspiration of mine, the, the biologist E.O. Wilson, he actually attributes this idea of this uh, neat tidy forest vision that we all have back to the tens of millions of years we spent evolving in these savanna-like environments. Anyway, uh, healthy forests are messy and they involve you know, not just evenly spaced trees, but all different shapes and sizes and ages of trees, tons of dead wood on the ground, uh, dead standing trees, all of this stuff that makes us really uncomfortable, but which are actually really important components of forest ecology. And two words that you're gonna hear me use to describe this stuff is diversity and complexity. So diversity is 
lots of different types of stuff, lots of different species of trees, lots of different types of different conditions within the forest. Complexity is this emergent quality that happens when you layer all of these different types of diversity on top of one another. So uh, diversity and complexity tend to develop in forests as they age. You know, certainly old growth forests and, and older forests on our landscape that were here 300 years ago were much more complex, even when they weren't old. So even old growth young forests, you know, forests resulting from a big windstorm would have been more complex than the analog of that that we have today. Um, but in general, forests want to be diverse and, to, and complex. And by want to be, I just mean that they tend to, to become that way over time. Uh, diversity, these qualities of diversity and complexity are linked to a lot of really important attributes of forest health, uh, incre increased climate resilience, uh, increased availability of different types of wildlife habitat, improved carbon sequestration and storage, and just generally forests which are more adaptive and rich with life than simpler forests. Um, another really th thing that's interesting as you think about complexity as sort of like all these different types of diversity layered on top of one another, uh, are these things called emergent properties. So forests are complex systems and uh, complex systems produce these qualities which are greater than the sum of their parts. And they just produce some really, you know, I wish I could spend all night just talking about that, but they produce some really interesting qualities which cannot be produced uh, by younger, simpler forests. So another part of reimagining forests and, and thinking of them not just as this whole huge volume of life, but also as systems which are dynamic, is that we need to throw out our old idea of that, the, that we would want to manage forests towards a condition of stability. So stability, keeping those trees alive, keeping everything the same. Once we recognize that, not just that uh, change and, and in the form, often in the form of mortality of trees, that change is beneficial, we also need to recognize that change is just going to happen, right? It's not a choice. The forest will change. And so instead of trying to manage forests to be stable, we want to manage them to be resilient. Resilient forests are forests that are capable of maintaining their health and their natural processes throughout great stress and change. So it's just like building a resilient community, right? Where a resilient community is defined by its ability to weather adversity and, and resilient forests are no different. And in addition to that, we think about managing adaptive forests, which are forests that have the tools to adapt and change to a wide variety of potential future conditions. And so this is really important because we don't know exactly how climate change will affect our forests. We have some really good ideas about what that's gonna look like, but we don't know exactly what that's gonna look like going into the future. We don't know how it'll affect our wildlife. We don't know what new pest or pathogen is coming. And so we really need to manage forests for uncertainty. Um, and we need to manage them for this vast array of possibilities, vast array of potential future conditions if we want to protect their function as wildlife habitat, as carbon sinks, as biodiversity refugia, as climate regulators, as sources of pollinators, as air and water cleaners, the list goes on. Um, both for managing for adaptability and managing for, for resilience, it's really important to manage for diversity and for complexity. So managing for these qualities, which already are sort of endemic to forests anyway, but which because of the legacies on our landscape, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, we don't have as much of uh, today. And it also involves managing uh, to mitigate some of these really pronounced biodiversity threats in our landscape that have been caused by humans. So stuff like deer overpopulations is increasingly a problem in Vermont. I know it's a big problem in New Jersey. Uh, invasive exotic plants, what we call invasives or non-native invasive plants, massive problem because they actually uh, outcompete native species and then they displace this, the other native species who are dependent on those native species. And then they also prevent this dynamic process of forest development by when there's a disturbance and the forest just naturally wants to fill that space that was vacated by a dead tree or a dead group of trees with life. Uh, with native species and with the many other species that are dependent on them. It instead fills with these non-native invasive species which don't have those evolutionary relationships. Um, it's also, it's important for the future, but it's also important to manage forests that are adaptive today as we lose tree species like ash. Um, and here in Vermont, we've effectively lost other tree species like chestnut and uh, butternut more or less from our forest, beech. Um, 
suffering from this a pathogen called beech bark disease. We are just today even, and we expect this to continue into the future, facing this massive array of, of threats and stressors, and we need to give our forests the tools to adapt to them. So of the many cool and amazing properties of forests, this is one that has really like captivated the world. So the wood wide web is what it's called in some cases. What, it, what I'm talking about is that most trees and plants require or at least benefit from a mutualistic association with what we call mycorrhizal fungi. Fungi that grow from trees roots, they help them uptake water and nutrients from the soil and they may even connect trees together. And through that network, trees are able to do a lot of cool things, subsidize each other, share resources. Um, these relationships are, are famously, although I, I have to say pretty inaccurately, um, written about in the best-selling book, The Hidden Life of Trees by Peter Woolhaven. Um, and, you know, this, it's just, you know, th it's based on really real research and it's really important. You know, we've learned we learn so much about forests and the way they function as systems. And these mycorrhizal networks uh, are incredibly important. What's, what's important to also remember about them is that they're very resilient. So like when a tree dies, uh, they don't die. You know, they're adapted to these systems which are dynamic and with, within which death has been happening for thousands of years. Um, and so they're, they're, not, they're not very sensitive. They're actually very resilient systems. The other thing to remember about forests um, is that they're, you know, and especially in relation to the last slide, that idea of the wood wide web, is that there's a real temptation to mythologize forests. So to think about them, we, we hear that forests are sharing resources and we hear that they're doing all these cool, like altruistic things. And then we're like, forests are utopias. There's these perfect communities and we anthropomorphize trees, right? We think of them like people, um, especially when we learn about those connections and those properties. But you know, as a as a person who is has spent my life working with trees, I would say that that if we and with forests, I would say that if, when we mythologize forests, we miss what I believe are the most important lessons that they have to teach us, which is that forests are messy. They are imperfect. They are messy in a, in a physical sense. They look messy, but they're also, um, you know, these these really imperfect, never ending. Uh, changing systems. There is no endpoint. There is no point to reach. And within this forest, it is not a utopia. You know, it's trees die, things eat each other, parasitize or kill, parasitize each other, kill each other. Those same mycorrhizal networks can also be used to pass harmful chemicals between trees. And so I think it's when we, you know, when we recognize that forests are imperfect and that they are messy, you know, much in the same way that our, our human communities are, are not utopias, right? That's when we really can really start to understand them as they are. All right, legacy. So legacy is a big word. Uh, in forest management, legacy is a really powerful term. Uh, I think a lot about it in terms of the legacy that we leave for future generations. You know, when we ask ourselves, what kind of a world do we wanna leave for our children, for our children's children? I also think about it a lot because all of our forests are incredibly, incredibly altered. You know, if you if you walk into a forest today and you think that that forest is typical uh, of any time in the last hundred thousand years, you're completely wrong. We have created forests which are completely changed from even what they were a few hundred years ago, um, and that is the legacy that we stand on. We don't get to pick the legacies that are inherent across our landscape. Similarly to the fact that we don't get to pick the legacies in our in our human communities, right? We get what we get. And so the only choice is what are we going to do about it? Interestingly, uh, you might hear me use the word legacy also to describe forest systems. It's also a biological term. So legacies are also the pieces and the parts of past forests that permeate into new generations. So it could be like an old tree from a past generation of trees that exists in a young forest something like that. So it is a, a, great, a great metaphor for talking about a whole bunch of different things. In New Jersey, similar to where, where I am in Vermont, um, we saw a massive amount of land clearing in the last couple hundred years. And New Jersey was actually a little sooner, starting in the 1700s. 
In Vermont, it really started in the early 1800s, peaking in the mid 1800s, which I believe was when the peak of deforestation in New Jersey was as well. We think that uh, about 80% of our state was cleared at that time, which is amazing to think about considering that most of New England was probably 90 to 95% forested. Uh, and in 50 years with axes and hand saws and draft animals, uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of that forest land was clear and converted to agricultural land. Um, the inciting event in Vermont and in a lot of parts of New England for this was actually for, for sheep pasture, that there were these Merino sheep in the Napoleonic Wars of Europe, they were like the special sheep that the King of Spain had and you couldn't export them. And then uh, Napoleon caused all this chaos in Europe and some of them were allowed to be exported. Uh, and you know, in, by 1837, just in Vermont, there were about one, somewhere between one and two million of these sheep. Sheep can graze anywhere. And so pretty much, you know, any forest you've ever been in may have been a sheep pasture at some time in the last 300 years. Uh, in Vermont, virtually everything was. And it, it would, it boggles your mind when you see these places that were sheep pasture. So massive scale changes on the landscape occurring within a, a single, a single human generation during this time. And of course, when you go from a state or a region which is 90, 95% forested to one that is 20% forested, it's gonna have massive effects on wildlife. In Vermont, uh, we lost a ton of different wildlife species. And I know that this story in, in New Jersey is very similar. So between the 1700s, and the 1800s, we lost uh, beaver, turkey, fisher, you might call them fisher cats, moose, caribou, elk, a species of eastern elk, which a species of elk called eastern elk, which is now extinct, uh, catamount wolves, bear, otter, Canada geese, marten, passenger pigeons, which are now extinct. Um, this is a picture of the last catamount, which the, the eastern cougar, by the way, is a species that was also, is also native to New Jersey. Um, and this was shot in uh, 1881 and declared, ex finally declared extinct in Vermont in uh, 2018. So, in addition, you know, again, we're reimagining forests, we're thinking about forests beyond the trees, it's the whole volume of life. And so what you see is the loss of that, that forest, that living structure around which that community is built, and then these massive cascading, cascading implications on whole wildlife communities. And it didn't take long before people saw these massive ecosystem-wide effects. Um, the species that you see here is beaver, reintroduced to, into Vermont in the early 1900s reintroduced uh, actually throughout its native range. The, uh, there's some really cool books about beavers out there. My favorite one that I've, I'm just finishing reading is the one Eager by Ben Goldfarb, where it will just make you think that beavers are gonna save the world. It's pretty amazing. But there, there are some incredible facts about the abundance of beavers prior to European colonization that there may have been as many as, uh, in parts of New England, 300 beaver dams per square mile. So a square mile, 640 acres, that's a beaver dam every two acres throughout our valleys. And so where I come from, that means that basically all of our villages would have been underwater. Uh, beavers were extirpated from our region, primarily for their use in millinery, hat making. Uh, and they were actually uh, driven out of most of their habitat pretty early. So by the, by the late 1600s, there were hundreds of thousands of beavers being shipped to, to Europe all the time and actually incited some conflicts between indigenous peoples as they trapped out beaver. They were trading beaver pelts to Europeans for all this cool stuff. And um, as they got trapped out, they basically uh, went to war with their neighbors to try and get a hold of their beaver trapping grounds so they could get their beavers so they could trade them for more European goods. Anyway, so um, beavers are an example of a species that was reintroduced into Vermont. There are many others that were reintroduced um, deer were reintroduced into Vermont as they were into New Jersey uh, and as were turkeys. In Vermont there was for a long time a bounty on porcupines because Fisher, the Fisher cat, which is a, a huge weasel, I don't know if you have them down there or not, but um, they are the native predator of porcupines and without the Fisher cat the porcupines just exploded in population and they like essentially eat wood and so they were just like eating people's houses so there was a a bounty on them where you could turn in a pair of ears, pair of porcupine ears, and you get issued like the bounty, which was a quarter or something um, for decades. Um, but the fish were then reintroduced. They're extremely rare, but they do occur in Northern New Jersey. They are, yeah, they are, they are a, um, 
people have a complex relationship with them because they do also eat pets. Um, but they but they are native and they're the reason they were extirpated is because they're another fur bearer. So all of this was exacerbated by the fact that uh, you know, at the same time we were that we were clearing our forests, we were also managing our remnant forests very intensively. Uh, I learned, you know, when I was in school, I learned that 80% of New England was cleared for sheep pasture. In reality, probably only about 60% was ever cleared at one time, and the rest of it was being very intensively exploited for, for wood. Um, you got to remember that in the early 1800s, this is pre-advent of the wood stove, so a normal home might burn 40 or 60 cords of wood a year. Uh, and they were using wood for everything. They were burning wood and locomotives. Uh, the, by, the eight, by 1870, all the railroads in the US were using about 7 million cords every year. Railroad ties for the railroads were a major, major consumer of wood. Um, railroads were using about 30 million cords a year just for replacing uh, used railroad ties, which is about the timber from 150,000 acres a year. Um, there's a really cool book called American Canopy, which, which really goes through some of these historic land uses um, and is a really great book to check out. Forests were often uh, you know, allowed to grow, but then clear cut on these really short rotations, like 30 year rotations for stuff like fence posts and charcoal. So part of this, you know, what was wrong with this early uh, you know, forest management, if you wanna call it that, what it really was is, is probably closer to mining than it is to, to real management or what I would call forest management. Uh, it was based on some pretty, you know, at that time contemporary, but in retrospect, antiquated ideas about how forests work and what our responsibility is to them and how we manage them sustainably. Uh, there was this idea of the regulated forest, the idea that we could and should manage every single aspect of forests, you know, and manage them really, really intensively to produce timber as efficiently as possible. Um, there is decadent trees, which are just, you know, big trees that I now call legacy trees, these really important trees to the forest uh, that, you know, we cut them just to get them out of there because we thought they were taking up space and, and light that we could be using to grow young thrifty trees, um, which were more valuable. A lot of high grading, high grading is just where you go into the woods and you cut all the most valuable trees and you leave the less valuable trees. The most valuable trees are usually the healthiest trees in the woods. And so you can have all these long lasting demographic consequences on the forest uh, and poor protection of soils, just um, not doing stuff that we do now, like putting water bars in roads to divert water off the surface of roads and protect our waterways and our water quality uh, and the sustainability of our access infrastructure. The result of all this is that we ended up with forests which are really, really different now. So across our region, we did see pulses of reforestation starting when the, those wool markets crashed in the, in the mid, late 1800s. But really, um, most of the forests in our region are about 60 to 100 years old. So we're talking about Great Depression, World War II, 1950s and 60s is when we saw most of our forests start their lives. So 60 to 100 years old is not even the generation of, or not even the length of a single generation of many of our species of trees. They are babies. And, and for a forest to develop a lot of those qualities like diversity and complexity might take multiple generations of trees, hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, and so our forests are just worlds apart, you know, from, from you know, sort of their biological potential and also what they were just a couple centuries ago. So what we have today are younger forests, we lack big trees, we lack diversity, complexity, deadwood, soil carbon as compared to forests that were here a few hundred years ago across our landscape. So we lack diversity within a forest. We also lack diversity across our landscape. So a few hundred years ago, our landscape would have been a balance of not just old forest, but also forests of all different shapes and sizes and ages. We think that probably in our region, only about 55 to 60% of the forests were actually what we would now call an old growth forest. The, the balance were all forests in all different stages of development. And there was uh, many different, you know, there was this mosaic of different forests at different stages of development, different shapes and sizes and species uh, across our landscape. We also have altered tree species condition because some of those forests that were probably very common prior to European colonization uh, aren't good at growing in old fields as a first generation. Um, so here in Vermont, beech is a species which was probably 
40 to 60 percent of all the trees in our state. It's a fast growing shade, or I'm sorry, slow growing shade tolerant species. It cannot grow in an open field. And so our forests are skewed towards these species, which just happen to be able to grow in an old field like white pine, red maple, stuff like that. And as a result, of course, uh, the wildlife that are utilizing the habitat of, of those altered forests are also affected. We are in this moment, uh, you know, I think it's really important when we, when we talk about forests and when we talk about ecosystems and anything really related to climate change that we really broaden out what that means. So climate change is really, really important and it's an enormous, uh, incredibly scary and incredibly huge uh, thing that will affect our ecosystems and us, obviously, um, but it is not the entirety of the threats that our ecosystems and our critters, our biodiversity faces. Global change is a, is a better term. So global change is climate change plus all of those other human caused stressors. So climate change plus stuff like the altered natural disturbances, disturbance regimes that we have now, storms of increased uh, intensity, stuff like that, getting all of our, getting you know similar amounts of rain, but getting it like all at once, getting not reliable winters, stuff like that. Um, early snows, late snows, droughts, all this stuff. Invasive exotic, AKA non-native invasive plants, animals, pests and pathogens are affecting our forests. Deforestation, forest loss, uh, and the conversion of forest to other uses and, fragment and forest fragmentation. Deforestation is probably the single most, uh, the, the, the thing which is affecting both climate change and also the fate of our forest the most, because if a forest is deforested, especially if it's deforested and turned into a, a permanent use like housing or you know, commercial use or whatever, not to throw any shade at those uses, but uh, that's permanent. And forests, if, if there'll never be a forest again, they can't provide any of these other benefits that we're talking about, climate mitigation, wildlife habitat, clean air, clean water, et cetera. So it's all of these other things sort of occur within our ability to limit deforestation. Pollution is another one. So we, we build up, it's not, just, it's not just climate change or warming, it's all of this, this volume of stressors that are affecting our forests. In the midst of that, we're also in the middle of a mass extinction event, the sixth such event that we know of in the history of the world, but the first, which has been caused by a single species, uh, which is us, we are in the middle of this, this, well, this epic, which we call the Anthropocene, a geologic era in which humans are, are the dominant influence on climate and ecology in the world. A massive constriction of biodiversity globally, uh, global animal, Populations have declined by 68% since 1970. So that means that there are many, many, you know, less than half the number of animals on the planet than there were 50 years ago. Uh, and we have extinctions and um, threats of extinction occurring all over the place. I could rattle off some really scary facts, um, and I will. <laughs> um, so we think about a million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction, which includes about 40% of amphibians a third of reef forming corals, more than a third of marine mammals. Uh, we know of about 700 uh, vertebrate species which have gone extinct um, in the last or in the last four centuries. And invertebrates, bugs essentially, which make up about 97% of all the, the species on earth and many of which we don't even know about yet, uh, have lost conservatively 100,000 species. This is a, this picture here is a, a picture of the Eastern elk, which was a forest dwelling elk, which I believe New Jersey is also in its native range, um, which used to be in Vermont. So what's biodiversity? I talk about it a lot. It's really, really, really important. Biodiversity is short for biological diversity. And essentially all it is, is variation. The variation between different species, the variation between different ecosystems across our landscape, even the variation between genetics uh, within a species. So there could be biodiversity even encompasses that. When we talk about trying to promote uh, connectivity between habitats and also wildlife connectivity, part of what we're trying to do is uh, to promote the movement of species so that they can be 
resilient and adaptive and move as their climate changes or at different stages in their life or who knows what's going to happen to other parts of their habitat. So they need to be able to move to different areas. But we also need to really look after their genetic fitness, their ability to genetically within their populations adapt to our changing world. Uh, and so we need to look after even biodiversity on that scale. Um, and this is, this is a definition paraphrase from, from my guy, E.O. Wilson as well. Uh, biodiversity, simply put, when you look into forest ecology, again, and you're seeing forests as they truly are, which is much more than trees, you know, built around trees, but much more than trees, all this different stuff, you see that biodiversity is what makes ecosystems work, what makes them resilient. Uh, I would argue it makes them beautiful. I call it the currency of our ecosystems. Uh, forests cannot function by trees alone. They need these animals. They need these plants. They need these fungi and these bryophytes and these all of these different pieces and parts of the system in order to function. Um, it's not just about they're cool because they're cool. They're cool because they make the system work. Uh, again, you know, I, I, I talked about this briefly. Forest loss, really, really, really scary. From a climate or carbon mitigation perspective, uh, stopping deforestation entirely or mitigating deforestation is far orders of magnitude uh, more impactful than anything we do with respect to forest management. So uh, it, it, like if you look at the situation globally, forest management almost doesn't matter. Um, deforestation matters and reforestation matters as a climate mitigation strategy. Um, and it's just such a profound impact on our forests. We think that globally we've lost about a third of our forests. And as of 2020, we're losing about 30, 13 million acres a year, largely to conversion, a lot of it for agriculture actually. Um, ecosystem loss is the greatest threat to biodiversity globally. Um, and again, the most important strategy for mitigating climate change. Okay, so all this is, I know that's all a lot of scary stuff and um, depressing, but all this is to say, here we are, right? And we live in this incredibly altered landscape to pretend that we don't, is just to stick your head in the sand. Um, we're here we are in a changed and a changing world, right? We need to recognize where we are, um, that we are off the map, in, in more ways than one. And so as we think about managing ecosystems to be, you know, not maybe even as they were, but to be resilient and adaptive and dynamic, uh, it's really important to recognize that. I think a lot about this word responsibility. So, so here we are, we have these legacies on our landscape, incredibly changed landscapes. We're in the midst of a biodiversity crisis and a climate crisis. Um, what is our responsibility to our forests and to our other ecosystems. What do we owe to them? What do we owe to each other? You know, what's our responsibility to work actively to correct issues that maybe we didn't solve? Um, I think a lot about the amazing book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is by Robin Wall Kimmerer. She talks about the fact that in our culture, we think about when we buy land, we, we get a bundle of rights, right? Like here are the rights that you own you own the right to mine it and to log it and to subdivide it and whatever else, all these different rights that you have. But we don't think about a bundle of responsibilities that also comes along with it. Like what is our responsibility to just sort of pick up this place, you know, this piece of land that we're the steward of or, or whatever, this piece of the world of which we have responsibility and just help it, you know, and just be responsible to it. You know, how do we stand? I think in, in when I walk through the forest and I'm in these forests that are incredibly altered and young and simple and invaded with invasive plants, you know, I think about how do I stand, you know, from this place where we are right now, how do we move forward in a way that is going to protect the things that matter in the world? And, and I would also ask, how do we in the process of doing that, in the process of taking responsibility, how do we build a relationship with our ecosystems that is positive in, in a holistic sense? And, and what does that even mean? I, I can tell you for me, it doesn't mean doing nothing. It means what can I do to make it better? Uh, in her Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Sixth Extinction, which is another really good book, Elizabeth Colbert reminds us that we are also 
you know, not separate from our ecosystems, that we are actually completely dependent upon them. Uh, I really like the way that she put this. She said, having freed ourselves from the constraints of evolution, humans nevertheless remain dependent on the Earth's biological and geochemical systems. Uh, we are still completely dependent on ecosystems for our lives and for our quality of life. And the other thing that we need to recognize is that we don't have a choice over whether we impact them or not. You know, we, we seem to think that if we can like, just, you know, if we can just push all the, the scary, you know, the, all the resource production that we use and we just don't have to see it and it's, and it's gone, it's somewhere else. If we just push that off to the periphery, that everything will be okay. Well, everything we do impacts ecosystems. And so the question is not if we want to have an impact on them. The question is, what do we want that impact to be? There is no way to live our lives without consuming things in the world. And so we can deny that or we can be proactive about it and pragmatic about it. Globally, we consume, the United States in particular consumes a lot. We are about less than 5% of global population and we consume about a third of its resources. So those impacts happening to the world disproportionately are due to us and, and our choices and the things that we do and the resources that we consume that we you know, are sort of out of sight, out of mind. And I would add that uh, it's also an environmental justice issue because those climate change and resource extraction disproportionately affects poor and more vulnerable communities. Uh, you know, as we sort of think about our relationship with the world and how we want to manage our forests and, and, and all of the many different choices that we have to make, it's really important that we think about, you know, the quality of both our ecological reality and our, and our human reality, right? We want to build a world that's more just and more equitable, where people have the things they need to be healthy and happy. Um, if you haven't heard them before, these ideas of environmental, just, environmental justice in, slash injustice, climate justice, climate injustice are really, really important. And basically what it's saying is that uh, certain communities, impoverished communities in particular, and communities of color, are much more likely to live in polluted areas and have exposure to toxic substances. They're less likely to have access to clean air and clean water. They're more likely to have their health compromised by pollution. They're more likely to live near a hazardous waste site, more likely to impact, be impacted by climate change. And, and the list goes on. It's, it's really a sobering stuff. And we need to recognize that many of these, these impacts are a direct result of our resource consumption, um, where the stuff that we use comes from. Um, which brings us to wood, right? So no resource is perfect. Um, you know, where we get the stuff that we need to live happy and healthy lives is, is always going to be a little messy, but, but wood, I would argue is a pretty good one. It's really, really important that we think about where things come from. Where do the things that we buy and that we use and the energy and the resources that we consume come from? every single one of those comes at an environmental cost. And we are just so blessed and so privileged that we don't have to deal with a lot of the, the ramifications, the impacts on those costs, um, on peoples and on ecosystems and on species worldwide, but they exist. I really, really believe that one of the, the really amazing things about forest management, and this is not to say categorically like all forest management is good, but if it's done well, it's producing a local renewable resource. And local renewable resources are a massive force for good in terms of protecting biodiversity, human health, human rights, mitigating climate change and environmental and climate justice globally. Using renewable resources instead of non-renewable resources, which is most of what we use right now, uh, it does all of those things. Uh, and also just recognizing that uh, resource production is always going to be uncomfortable and, and maybe it should be, you know, maybe we should be consuming res the resources that we use and producing those impacts right here so that we can make real choices about the effects that we have and, and, you know, be like, wow, this is a really big deal. Our lives are really expensive and, and be able to make those choices and to bear the brunt of our own choices. So a big part of my life has been uh, answering this question of, you know, number one, how do we take care of our forest? And then number two, as we build this relationship with this forest, you know, one which is built on responsibility and standing on those legacies across our landscape, 
how do we reimagine not just forests, but within forests, our reimagined idea of what forests are, reimagine forest management and ask the questions, can forest management have a positive impact on forests? Is it, can it have a positive influence on our world? Um, how do we manage forests in a way that is not just about, not just about resources, but also about building a better world, about protecting biodiversity, about help giving our forests the tools to respond to a changing climate? Um, I think the answer to these questions are yes. I think forest management can be a force for good in the world. I think it's really important that we think about this within the context within the landscape context. So forests are amazing, they're, they're fractals. So they have these patterns that mirror themselves in many different scales. And um, you can endlessly like zoom into the minutia and zoom out to these big, huge, you know, systems. And uh, all of it will be really, really interesting. But let's start from the landscape scale. We need ecologically functional landscapes. So in a region which is mo has mostly privately owned forest land, this means sort of cobbling all these pieces together with private and public land um, and figuring out a way to provide a landscape which is functional. We need forests that are managed in different ways. We need managed and unmanaged forests. I think both of those things are incredibly important and they're complementary. We need different, even a diversity of different approaches to forest management. So as we think about managing landscapes for diversity, resilience for adaptability, it's not just about managing the ecosystems that way, it's also about managing ourselves and managing the different ways that we manage the forests so that we don't put all of our eggs in one basket in any respect. We need to keep large forested blocks intact. So limiting fragmentation, fragmentation just being the splitting up of big chunks of forest into smaller chunks of forest with development and roads. Um, concentrating development if we can. So concentrating it in areas that are already fragmented, leaving areas that are undeveloped, undeveloped and protected. We need to protect habitats and species that are rare at risk and to address some of the landscape level threats that we have to forest and other ecosystems. Our goal should be this, you know, overall across all these different parcels of land and different ecosystems and all these different areas, a functional resilient landscape that's providing refugia for our native species, that's protecting the function of our forest ecosystems, and that is in, in so many ways fulfilling our responsibility to our communities, our global community, and to future generations. Uh, and I mean that uh, biologically, climatically, economically, aesthetically, all of the things. I think it's really important uh, to address this idea of active versus passive management. Excuse me. And here's why, because it's really, really tempting. You know, there's all like, we have these complex lives and everything's really complicated. And uh, to dig into every single, the details of every single complex idea is incredibly time consuming and energetically consuming. And so it's a lot easier to sort of divide these things up into like polarities. So I like this, I don't like this. It's this way or it's that way. Forests are not like that. Uh, forests are these incredibly nuanced, adaptive, diverse, uh, complex systems. They're defined by their variability uh, and their irregularity. Um, and so with this question about, is it better to manage forests or not manage forests? The answer is yes. The answer is that both of these strategies have a place on our landscape. Um, you know, it's, it's important to recognize sort of in the conversation about passive management that, that old growth forests, they are important just because they're old, they're important because of the way that they are, right? Because they have these really interesting and important qualities and because they're so underrepresented on our landscape as compared to how they would have been historically. But I really believe that both managed and unmanaged forests have a place on our landscape. The benefits of active management and specifically the ecological forestry that I do, the type of management that I do in forests here in Vermont, is that we have the opportunity to protect our biodiversity by creating conditions of old forests and just general conditions of complexity, diversity, irregularity, which are underrepresented in our landscape today. And we can create those conditions now and protect our wildlife now uh, rather than waiting a couple hundred years for those forests to develop. It's not perfect. You know, we can't make a forest an old growth forest, but we can make them old growthier 
And in the process, we can protect our biodiversity, which needs help now. Um, and we can produce rene local renewable resources in the process. The other thing to think about is that, again, uh, we don't really even know where we're going with these with these old growth forests because the future is so uncertain. But we do know that if we can get into our forests and help encourage them to be more diverse, more complex, uh, eliminate biodiversity threats like non-native invasive plants, like deer browse, stuff like that, and encourage them to be diverse now, that we can help them deal with these uncertain effects of climate change in the future. So I practice this type of forestry. I also, so I, I do both things, right? Like I, in the town forest that I manage, almost every one of them has a reserved zone. That's an area that we don't manage. And the idea of that is, even if we're managing forests to be more like old forests, it's never gonna be exactly the same. So let's do both, right? Um, and well, and the other cool thing is that they provide us these areas that we're just never gonna manage. And there'll be these really cool places to educate people and to show the contrast between managed and unmanaged forests. Um, so the idea of ecological forestry is that we're managing forests not solely for a resource, but we're managing them like they manage themselves. We're managing them as these complex reimagined systems. Or, and we're recognizing within that that it's not just about trees. Trees are really important. Uh, or we're using the cutting of trees in some cases to manipulate where those forests are headed and to create these like simulation natural disturbances. But we're recognizing the importance of all the organisms and the processes that make forest work. And in general, the work that I do is centered around making these young, really altered forests become more diverse, more complex, and more like old forests. And doing that within the, a commercial context, using logging as a tool to accomplish that objective. What does it look like? So we're creating simulated natural disturbances using logging as a tool, but we're, man we're looking at old growth forests and we're seeing how we can encourage those forests that are like that in the short term, like today. Um, managing for many different sizes and ages of trees, which is a quality of, of old growth forests, what we call structural diversity, many different sizes and ages and species of trees. Um, we're leaving lots of dead wood, so tons of dead wood on the ground because we're recognizing that dead wood in old forests is this like diagnostic condition. They all have so much dead wood on the ground. And uh, because of our land use history, there's just not a lot of dead wood on the ground. And dead wood is pretty amazing. It can have as much as four times as much living biomass in it as, as living trees. And it's this really important habitat for fungi and for invertebrates and for uh, amphibians and all different kinds of things. And it also benefits forest hydrology and it stores carbon. We are also retaining some big legacy trees uh, forever in the woods. So in my woods, I've, or in the, in the forest that I manage, I've gone through and labeled these legacy trees. These are big trees that are just gonna live out their natural lives and will afford to the forest the, few, the benefits of big old trees. It doesn't have to be every tree, but you know, we know that old growth forests, hardwood forests in general have like 10 to 12 old trees per acre. And that if we cut every tree every time it gets big, that we lose these incredible biodiversity benefits and wildlife habitat benefits of those old trees, not just as living trees, but also as they decline, as they die, as they fall on the ground. Um, and we also create pockets of early successional habitat, larger openings, and other unique conditions which have landscape level importance and which are underrepresented on our landscape today. We also address biodiversity threats, um, invasive plants, deer, forest loss, development, climate change, and that requires us to do these really unpleasant stuff, these compromises that we don't want to make. Um, and I think, you know, when I think about these things, cutting trees, I love trees and I cut them all the time. I love deer uh, and I kill them. I eat all organic food. I do not like the way that, that herbicide is used in most, most contexts. And I use it on invasive plants all the time. Um, and I don't like it when people tell me what to do, but I advocate for rules in our communities that restrict development or that concentrate it in areas that are already developed. And you know, the reason for all these things that I'm constantly just like telling people to do stuff they don't want to do and making them uncomfortable by trying to like, you know, get them to do the stuff that, that makes them really uncomfortable is because we're in unprecedented times. And uh, it calls for us to make these incredibly difficult decisions and these incredible compromises to do things that make us really uncomfortable. 
And um, in my mind, what's really radical is not doing what makes you feel good. It's doing things that challenge us because you know that they're the right thing to do. Um, and there are many times in managing forests and other ecosystems that we're called upon to just you know, do these things where we're like, I never thought I'd do that. And we end up doing it. Why do we do it? Because it's part of our responsibility towards our forests, you know, where and how they are and our relationship with them. Um, I also think a lot about multi-solving, you know, forest management is not a panacea, but if we do it well, and this is again, we, it can be done well, it can be done not well. Um, it addresses many different issues at once. So it produces renewable resources, which again have these local and global biodiversity benefits, uh, climate benefits, human rights benefits. Uh, it can help protect biodiversity locally and globally, again, by creating conditions which maybe are underrepresented in our landscape, um, you know, and creating these unique habitats for many of our native species and making our forests more like old forests, which is what almost all of the species on our landscape are adapted to. We can address the legacies of human land use across our landscape, again, turning young simple forests into more complex forests. And we can help our forests prepare for this incredibly uncertain future, which we have caused, you know, and, and help them have the tools so that our children and our grandchildren and successive generations will still be able to enjoy healthy forests. And this is my last slide. I just, I just want to point out again that Embracing nuance and just like wading into those murky waters is um, an incredibly important part about of being a human in the world, you know, and, and especially being a steward of our forests. Um, it just becomes increasingly clear to me that that again, what's really radical is not to sort of stake out one position on, you know, and be like, this is the way it is, this is always the way it is. It's to to get into these murky waters between these simple truths polarities to recognize stuff like I can love trees and I do I love them intrinsically I think that they have the right to exist and I own a skitter and I cut them all the time and I can hold both those things at once right same like I love deer I create amazing deer habitat I think that they're a credit I think they're a miracle and I kill deer to protect my forest from deer overpopulations, which is a human cause issue. Um, there are so many things like that. It's the same as sort of balancing managed and unmanaged forests. Like I can believe in forest management and I do, I believe in forest management. I could believe it can be done well. I believe it can be such an asset to our world. And I can also recognize that I don't think forest management is good or bad. I think it can be done really well. I think it can be done really poorly. Similarly with, with not managing forests, you know, I think not managing forests uh, can be profound and beautiful and just produce these incredibly unique ecosystems. And I think it can also be a form of, you know, just dis displacing our resource impacts on people who don't have the privilege to say no resource extraction here. And so it's just really, really important that we develop this, this nuanced perspective where we're understanding that things are, are far more complex uh, than we generally think. That's the last slide. If, if you do, if I haven't made you too mad and you do want to check out some of my resources, you can search for Chittenden County Forester on YouTube um, or you can check out my link tree, um, which has uh, articles I've written. And um, you, you, know, you can link to my YouTube and to some other resources that, that I've been involved with that I'm proud of. Um, and I think that we can also probably send out some of these links to you in a follow-up email after this presentation. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I would love to take your questions. First of all, thank you so much, Ethan. That was really great. I love the expression, old growthier. <laughs> old growthier, yeah, I didn't invent that one. I think that's a, a Bob Seymour. Excellent. Uh, we do have some questions that have come up in the chat. Uh, we have a raised hand as well. So if, you, if, you're, if you're raising your hand, um, do me a favor, just you can put your question in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, and I'm gonna start going through some of the questions that we had come in. <clears throat> First was just a comment by Clark Beebe, who's another one of the directors here with, with the Forestry Association. Uh, and he just put
quick comment in saying when thinking about turbulence in, in forests, the late Jim Finley always said that when a tree first sticks its head out of the soil with one or two tiny leaves, it looks around and asks, how can I kill my neighbors? <laughs> it is it is complex. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one thing, especially with that. Um, I And this is, you know, maybe it's a personal grudge, but um, that book, The Hidden Life of Trees, which I, I really don't like, um, because I feel like so much of it is, um, you know, anthropomorphizing trees and mythologizing them and taking research, which is real, but then like adding all this like personification to them. Everybody's just like, forests are perfect. You know, trees are this, this utopian community. And that's, to me, that's just not the lesson of forests for us. The lesson is that they're just complicated, you know? So <clears throat> a little earlier on in your presentation, we mentioned fishers and, um, Ryan was kind enough to share a trail cam picture of a fisher with us. So here it is. If anybody's interested in seeing a fisher in yeah. New Jersey, that was caught on a trail cam, I guess in December, 2020 here. So they're funny I critters. I mean, you see them walking through the woods, they look all awkward. Uh, <laughs> I thought they're very closely related to, to otters. So they're a weasel, but they're like a, almost the size of an otter. Uh, and so they, you're like, is that an otter running through the woods? But it's a fisher. Yeah, I love their tracks. I love seeing them up in the Adirondacks. And they also, in deep snow, they also are capable of taking down a deer. That's wild. Wow. Uh, Andy, you want to take, uh, you want to? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw a couple things at you, Ethan. First of all, just to echo what Karen said, thank you so much for your presentation. Man, it is, it takes some time to digest everything you, you throw at us. So um, I've kind of heard this talk somewhat already. And I'm like, man, just a lot of info. Well, well done. Thank you so much for just, um, you just challenge people to think, which is really the goal. Um, that you're, there's no, there's no clear cut answers, as you said. So, but it's yeah. making, it makes us think. Um, and uh, we, we really appreciate that. So, Thank you. Um, so uh, 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 one of the things around, uh, northern new jersey it came up in the chat um someone asked about you talked about creating early successional habitat mm -hmm. um as at, towards the end of your presentation um pockets of early early successional habitat so yeah. one of one of the things that that is a program here in new jersey in particular in northern new jersey mm -hmm. through the usda the nrcs for creating early successional habitat in particular for yeah. the golden wing warbler endangered oh, bird yeah. here so yeah. but there's been some controversy obviously sure. with should we be doing that how yeah. large of it an opening should we create are we doing more more bad than good you know it's just a evolving mm -hmm. conversation and, and people are kind of taking their yeah. their corners and um just curious somebody asked like what do, you, what do you think about the size of these openings should we be doing it etc yeah. etc well yeah and the and the answer is as it as it probably will be for all these is that it's complicated yeah. um so one thing we need to recognize there there is you know obviously we're all freaked out about about the climate crisis there there is a tendency sometimes to like focus on like managing a forest for one thing um and sometimes that one thing is carbon right like when people are like let's just manage our forest for maximum amount of carbon and we should be managing our forest for carbon but we also need to understand again all of these other things like is biodiversity not also <laughs> important you know it it's mm -hmm. it's we need what forest management really is is about balancing all of these different things it's not about managing for any one thing and so, yeah, like if you're making a big opening that's acres in size, you are, that is not a carbon optimal strategy, but it may be a strategy which is highly, highly beneficial, you know, to a whole array of different wildlife. One thing that I would say is that, um, you know, it's not, it's not appropriate everywhere. You know, you should be working with a wildlife biologist who knows like where to site those things, you know, because you can't just like put a big clear cut in the middle of a swamp and be like, great, I made some, you know, early successional habitat and you caused all these other issues in the process. However, uh, 
here, you know, here in Vermont, it's, it's something that we actually really need. And what we, what I would, what I would say is that with the caveat that, well, backing up, I always say that uh, an old growth forest, these old forests that we're so excited about, we want to find and we want to make more of them. Every old forest was a young forest once and it will be again, hmm. right? Forest management is cyclical. And uh, again, only probably about 55 or 60% of the forests on our landscape 300 years ago were what we would now call old growth or late succession forests. The rest was young forests, middle-aged forests, you know, all these other, everything in between. And all of those stages do have value. You know, they all have species that are specifically adapted to them, either for, you know, their, their, the entirety of their habitat or for some different stage of their life cycle. These young forests in particular are these really diverse habitats which are visited by all different kinds of critters. Um, but the difference between the way that we create early successional habitat now and the way that it was probably historically created is that what we really need is complex early successional habitat. So what that means is if you were to go out, if you were to take, you know, make a big clear cut, that was 25 acres and you cut every single tree on it, you know, you're, you're providing some components of that young forest habitat. You're, you're going to provide, you're going to get the vegetation response, right? Like the trees and the plant species that are adapted to that system, but you're not going to get some of the other attributes that would happen if, if that was just a windstorm, you know, or a, a mega flock of billions of passenger pigeons that visited there and crushed all the trees over 25 acres or, you know, a massive hurricane or whatever, which would have, you would have had dead wood on the ground and you would have had dead standing trees and you would have had residual trees and pockets of trees. So I think that um, I, I'm really interested in creating early successional habitats, but specifically I want to create what we call complex early successional habitat which is like early successional habitat, but, but is a little bit more modeled over what, after what a natural disturbance looks like. Um, but that said, yeah, I, I, believe it, I believe it's important, but you know, with, with all those caveats. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, kind of a follow-up, well, well, related question. Um, so I, I know Vermont has some, I think has some goals as it relates to old growth forest, kind of a mm -hmm. target. So we had a question, what proportion of old growth are you or Vermont in general kind of setting aside versus managed forests? Like what's, a, what's the target there and, and what, what do you think is a good number or a good goal? Yeah, we don't really know. I mean, one of the hard things is that all of this forest, you know, because all of our forest is so young and because it's all owned by private landowners, like it, it depends on what your definition of old growth is. Some people would define old growth as uh, forests which have never been cleared or never been disturbed, you know, or al alternately never been disturbed by European descended people. Um, whereas other people would define it as just a forest that's old and it's in this later stage of development or whatever. So if we defined it the first way, there's no way to make more of it, right? You have what you have and that's it. But in terms of you know, setting aside forests that's unmanaged that will eventually, you know, in 200 years become old growth. There was a, there was a report that came out called Vermont Conservation Design that was pretty neat. And, and they suggested having 9% uh, was what they suggested. Okay. Um, however, it's hard because we could already have 9%. We, we don't know. I mean, you know, in our national forest, there's uh, at least 100,000 acres that's not managed. In our state forest, there's probably another 100,000 acres plus. Um, and then across all these private lands, there are many pieces of land that are not managed and they may comprise far more than that. They just haven't, it hasn't been 200 years since they were a field. So we don't really know how much we have. Um, but yeah, it's hard to know. It's hard to know, you know, what the answer is. In other parts of the world, what they do is they have like, and this is actually what E.O. Wilson, uh, what his preferred method would be, would be you have like forests which are completely unmanaged, and then you have forests which are uh, really intensively managed, like, like managed only for timber, you know, like super, super, super intensive plantations. Um, you know, and what, what most of us do, and certainly what I do is, 
you know, I want to see like a gradient of different approaches between those two extremes, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, um, and, I, and I would say that, you know, most of the research that I've seen suggests that uh, we can have more reserves when you think about resources as well. We can have more reserves if we also have more intensively managed forests, you know, or we can have more intensively managed forests. And, you know, it's, it's like they, they fluctuate with each other in terms of the amount of wood that we actually have to use. The part, I, I'm not, I'm excited about reserves. I'm not that excited about that intensively managed forest, but I'm really excited about the in-between um, and how, you know, not worrying too much about the specific quota of how we get enough old growth, but wondering how we can create those types of conditions across our landscape at scale. Got it. Uh, a question came in that says, it seems that if you disturb a portion of a mature forest, so again, back to this early successional habitat idea, yeah. that we are encouraging or allowing invasive species to get deeper into our forest, so to speak, how, mm -hmm. how, how do you answer that question outside of kind of preemptively yeah. dealing with it and then following up later? Yeah, I mean, that's what you do. Um, I, the, the idea that you can uh, solve or really even mitigate the invasive species problem by not breaking the canopy, it's just not true. I mean, it, it just is, you're just delaying the the inevitable maybe by a couple of years. You know, what's gonna happen when those trees blow over? What's gonna happen, anything. I think that um, the sort of like the, the, what I would call like the radical approach or the, the proactive approach is just deal with the invasives and use the right tools, know what they are, spend the time and, and deal with them rather than, you know, trying to, you know, be really scared about breaking the canopy because you're gonna, gonna create a problem. Um, and, and the other thing I would say is again, when I'm managing the forest, I'm trying to break the canopy because I wanna create a more complex, diverse forest. I wanna create you know, a shrub, a understory shrub layer so that you know, black-throated blue warblers can nest there. And I wanna, I wanna you know, have all the biodiversity benefits of a forest which does not have just, you know, like almost every one of our forests, which is not just even aged with a contiguous canopy. And so I just deal with the invasives. I, and I do, which I, I do what I got to do to deal with it. Um, the other thing that I would say is, um, well, well, we'll get into that if we get into it. Yeah, that's all I'll say. Um, a, a, a little comment something a stat i wanted to throw at you ethan and then you can kind of uh comment as as you want to so i was, I was speaking to somebody this week and i guess there's a stat that the the u.s forest service put out that says that the average american i think it's average american yeah uses 1.75 pounds of wood per day uh -huh. across various different you know products or whatever so just doing some simple figuring, okay? So if you take 1.75 pounds of wood per day, you multiply that by 365 days in a year, that means each person is utilizing 640 pounds of wood per year. Convert that to tons, okay? I'm going somewhere. That's a third of a ton per person per year. In New Jersey, we have 9 million people. So now we're at, um, what, 3 million tons of wood are being utilized each year by New Jerseyans. Yeah. Um, and if, if you figure that, let's just say an average 80 to 100 year old forest, let's just say there's 50 tons of, of wood there, just throwing a number, an easy number. So we take our 3 million tons uh, needed divided by 50 tons of wood per acre, and we need to clear 60,000 acres of forest each year to supply New Jerseyans with the wood they need. So, so just kind of play off that maybe as you're talking yeah. about this like discrepancy of, of resource use between, you know, the United States and other countries and how we're displacing right. things maybe. Well, and, and what I would say, and, and we say a similar thing in Vermont, you know, is that um, you, you know, those, those imp the impacts of that wood production still exist. 
you know, you have just outsourced them to other places. So, and, and probably the places you've outsourced them to are places that are doing forest management that would make people in New Jersey really uncomfortable. You know, really, really intensive um, management that maybe doesn't hold at heart some of those other objectives that we might have, like wildlife habitat and protecting biodiversity and water quality and all those other things. Um, so that's, to me, local, lo especially local renewable resource production, but local resource production in general is just so powerful because it's like, here, here we are, these are the things we're consuming and it allows us to like, to, to like look at that thing and we're like, oh my, I can see what the impacts of this are, you know, here it is. And it allows us to make real choices. And, it, and, it, and I just think it's, it's incredibly important to, if you're gonna consume stuff, and if you're going to impact ecosystems to at least have to deal with those impacts at home. And so what you're talking about is the, the amount of wood use. That is a fraction of the amount of every other resource that we use. Mm. You know, in terms of the, think about the amount of plastic that we use. Think about, you know, which is petroleum, right? Like mm -hmm. think about the amount of gas and oil and diesel that's required to make your lives work. Think about, you know, the impacts of those resources. And to me, when, when I really put it in this sort of global context, and I think about that in general, the idea of being able to like, to harvest something as beautiful as a tree, you know, and to try and do it in a way that's making a forest more resilient and benefiting it in, in some way and helping it prepare for an uncertain climate future um, is so profoundly better than that. You know, mm -hmm. even, even though it can be like bittersweet, I love trees. Uh, it feels like the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. All right, we had a bunch of other <clears throat> questions come up in the chat here. Um, so let me just get back to where I was. Susan <clears throat> talked about, you know, a lot of the non native or um, engineered tree species that are planted in cities and urban areas. And uh, she was asking what our community has been doing to try to combat this, especially in the landscape architecture community, the idea of, you know, planting basically useless plants, invasive and non-native species that don't support native insects and birds and, and the like. You have any comment on that? Just in general? Yeah. And, and how, what we're doing about them? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So this is like, again, I just feel like I, <laughs> I just am all the time telling people these like really nuanced narratives about all these and then asking them to do something they really don't want to do. Um, so one of those things that has become a part of my life is using herbicide on killing on killing invasive plants. And believe me, if all you out there knew me, you would know how surreal it is to uh, for me being uh, you know a person who now like carries herbicide on me. <laughs> When I'm like walking around in the woods, it's, it's bizarre. And so the reason I do it is because these invasive plants are a massive biodiversity threat and because they're extremely virulent and at scale, they're almost impossible to control without using herbicide. So what I see is that people try to cut them or they try to pull them up and the, the amount of tenacity that's required to address a, even a moderate level invasive plant infestation um, is too much. And then they give up or they like they succeed in like hand pulling a little teeny tiny area and then the other 100 acres of their property is you know a lost cause so i i really like this tool shout out to i don't know who runs this company but i've probably gotten them a lot of business um shout out to this tool called a, a buckthorn blaster the buckthorn blaster um, the buckthorn blaster is a modified four ounce bingo dauber. So it's like you would use to like stamp a bingo card at when you go visit your grandma at the nursing home or whatever. Um, and um, it is, and you fill it with concentrated herbicide. There's a video on my YouTube channel about using this and what herbicide to use and what concentration and all this other stuff. Um, and it's a cut stump application. So what you do is you cut a woody invasive plant stem like up where I am it would be like shrub honeysuckle or Japanese barberry or common buckthorn multiflora rose anything like that 
you cut it. Yeah. Okay. Good. You cut it and then you just dab that sponge tip on the surface of the stem and you apply a thousandth of an ounce of herbicide and it goes only right on the surface of that stump and then it kills the plant. And if you've struggled with these invasive plants and you've seen how, how incredibly good they are at sprouting, to have something that you know just kills it like that and allows you to just like move forward without having to constantly go back and redo what you already did is is incredible. Um, I really, I think for me, the transformative moment with herbicide was when I bought my land five years ago and I inherited 30 acres of wall to wall, three foot tall barberry, pure, nothing but, um, and it's gone. You know, I I set this forest, which would have been just increasingly infested by this non-native plant with which many of our native, you know, displacing all of these native species. Um, and I changed that in a year, you know, and, and I, I fixed it. So it's, it's, it's profound. Um, and so, yeah, it's just one of these things. Again, I don't like herbicide. Um, if I had any other choice or felt that I did, I, I would do that. But but I don't, and so I use it happily. Yeah. I think I think um, just to build off what you said, Ethan, just as somebody who's out practicing forestry, like w when we're working, when our group is working together, one of the things we always ask is like, how are we going to affect change at scale? Yeah, and that's where herbicides come in. Like you just yeah. can't, like you you just can't get anywhere without without yeah. herbicides you're constantly in the same exact spot year over year over year and yeah. uh it's discouraging makes you want to give up so i i think for many reasons it's like herbicide is it has to be an option if you're going to well, affect change at scale yeah and if you're a person like me who you're like really don't like herbicide um think of how subversive it is that you took this tool this herbicide that was created to suppress biodiversity. And then you're using it as a restoration tool to promote biodiversity. And you mm, shove that in good. the chemical company's face. See what they think about <laughs> that. Happen. I like that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, in my experience in managing plants, herbicides get their bad rap from the agriculture industry where they're horribly, horribly overused just yeah. like insanely, it's like insane how much the volume of chemical that's put on the ground in the agriculture industry is devastating. But in horticulture and in forestry and silviculture, we're using very, very, very minute amounts. You know, these label rates are small per acre. We're not using a lot of chemical. And a lot of times, once we have it under control, we're using far less than the label rate maximum would allow. Um, mm -hmm. Like just these tiny, like, you know, like few ounces per acre, just such a small amount of, of, of chemical to control these plants. And we're improving the ecology of the ecosystem that we're managing. So, you know, yeah. it's, uh, I do like that irony. They were sort of using this yeah. harmful chemical to improve well, nature. I mean, it's similar. <laughs> like I think about it when I'm out there with my chainsaw and I'm like, I, my forest was brutally high graded just the loggers just went in there and they just we would say slicked it off you know they just like cut all the biggest nicest trees and created these just ripples you know these these implications that now I'm going to have to deal with for the next 100 years and and here I am with that same tool using it to do the exact opposite thing mm. you know it's like it, it feels very similar to me so um, and just on on the other end by the way to that person's question I would, I would also say on the other end that um, really encouraging native plantings is also really important. So getting, getting it so like in Vermont, I don't know if you have this in New Jersey, in Vermont, a lot of these invasive plants are now listed on something called a, a noxious weeds list. So you can't sell them anymore. That's really important. But then also encouraging people, like you could check out some of these books by Doug Tallamy, um, who's, a, who's an awesome backyard pollinator guy. Um, and he can give you some great ideas about how to encourage native plantings, both in your space and in your community. 
Yeah, I think that more, speaks more to what Susan's main question was, is was about the intentional planting of non-natives. And yeah, a lot of states are doing that. that. Those noxious weed lists are ways to codify, you know, preventing Home Depot and other landscape places yeah. selling these plants like barberry. Thanks is, for that. Is barberry um, allowed? Do they sell that in Vermont? Barberry? Okay. That's a no, that's a problem here for feet. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we have not successfully gotten the the state to kind of outlaw barberry. Like Pennsylvania, I saw just did it within yeah. the last month, I think. You guys um, must love. You guys must love ticks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we do, sure thing. Yeah, we've, we've got them all too. We're like right at the northern edge, I think, of the Lone Star and some of the southern ticks, and then we've got. Oh yeah, gotta you know, catch them all. Our black-legged yeah. ticks, we, you know, it's abundant here, for sure. Um, Diversity. So we're, we only got about two minutes left in our 90 minutes. Um, so I don't want to get too deep into any other. Some of these questions are, are pretty big questions. Um, that said, you know, if you feel like going a couple minutes over, you're welcome yeah. to. That's up to you. Um, if so, I'll I, just... I can, I can hang out for a few more minutes. Um, so... The next one that we had that I think was a bigger one was Susan asked, can forest preservation, and her example is Atlantic white cedar swamps, be considered forest management? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a good question. Um, I don't know anything about, uh, what was it? No, Atlantic, Atlantic white cedar. Yeah, we don't have that. But um, but yeah, I mean, I think some sometimes we'll call it like, like I called it in that presentation, I called it passive management, you know? and um, because, because one caveat that I would say is like, I don't think true no management, like nothing at all is ethical. And, and what I mean by that is that the baseline of responsible management is still dealing with some of these biodiversity issues. Like you can't have a forest that's in, totally infested with invasive plants and expect it to ever become old growth. It will not, you know, it will never become old growth. And so in that case, like, you could do passive management where you're not like managing the trees, but you still should and must, you know, control those invasive plants. Similarly, like deer could be a, a real factor that could prevent a forest from ever becoming old growth. So passive management, I think, I think is still management, um, you know, because it, it does require that. And then you'd have to be like monitoring for invasives and stuff like that all the time. But when, you know, when I talk about forest management, I'm usually talking about what we might call active management, which is, you know, it's at some, you know, you're not like out there cutting trees every day, but at some point you're, you're going to cut some trees to manage it in some way, or you're, you're at least open to doing so when it's appropriate to do so. We had a uh, real quick while we're, while we're continuing to answer some of these questions, we did have an, another, another Fisher uh, this one's a video came through from actually one of our directors. Um, so this is a Fisher cat climbing a tree in New Jersey. Uh, I believe it's, it was taken in New Jersey. Um, Whoa. Yeah, that's a great video. Cool. I've encountered a lot of different critters in the woods when I'm hunting. And the Fisher is the only one that I got a little bit nervous about. <laughs> I was like that that thing is really tough <laughs> they're really tough and yes. they uh they eat a lot of stuff I'll play it one more time for everybody while we continue on um we did have a question about controlling vines I, I I don't think we need to get into that because you I think you just did a good job of talking about controlling any woody plants yeah with um, that yeah that buckthorn blaster I'd recommend looking it up so Clark mentioned another quote from Jen Finley saying that forestry is not rocket science. Forestry is difficult, rocket science is knowable and calculable. I uh, thought that was pretty good. Um, Wendy asked what invasive species we, could, we should be concerned about in Northern New Jersey. I, I think maybe that's a question more for Andy. Um, I think they're probably the same, but. Yeah, I think they're similar. I mean, Ethan touched on quite a few of them. I think Barberry is the, like down here, Ethan, when you describe your 30 acres, okay, <laughs> my family property is quite large and we have, I'd say over a hundred acres 
just as you described where it's three to five feet tall you can't even walk through it and we're working on it we're making progress but there are thousands of acres in new jersey that are just like that um so i think i think barberry is kind of our nemesis down here it's a big issue and again if they're still planting it around every new home and landscaping it's going to continue we just we have to a, a guy i work with uh, dylan he 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 just kind of reminds our landowners like we just we just have to learn how to live with it and how to manage it um, we're not going to get rid of it. It's it's impossible. So right. um, what about stilt grass? I saw that question come up at one point. We're kind of helpless down here. What what do you what do you tell we people? Don't, we don't have it. Oh, you don't have it. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, it's lucky uh, you. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it's it's kind of everywhere too. Anytime you put a little trail in the woods, it shows up, you know. Jeez. So um, anyway, I, I we don't we don't have any good good remedies for it at the moment um maybe uh just to kind of wrap things up here and i just had a, a question that i thought of that i actually shared with ethan earlier this week that i i didn't know if we'd have time to answer but i just thought this might might serve everybody so most of our landowners uh or a lot of the people are on the call part of the forestry association some of the members they they own land and they don't own vast acres they don't own a thousand or 500 or even a hundred acres they own six 10 15 mm. 20 um what would you say to them can they can they make a difference kind of globally by investing in their little their little parcel their little world behind mm -hmm. their house or, or or whatever in their back 40 so to speak like what would you how would you encourage them i guess as we kind of wrap things up oh yeah i mean a hundred percent i mean i think you know we know that you can sort of think about like big scale, little scale. Um, in your backyard, you know, it can seem hopeless, but doing stuff like controlling invasive plants so that you're not throwing invasive seeds all over the place, it, it does make a difference. And especially if you can get excited about it and get your neighbors to do it, um, you know, you in small measures, we can improve our backyard habitats and you know, we can provide better habitat for pollinators, better habitats for birds, better habitat for other wildlife across our landscape and mitigate some of these other biodiversity threats. Um, you know, again, I think Doug Tallamy would be a really good resource for a lot of folks here to look up as a, as a sort of guide for that, you know, how we manage our backyards to be this really like robust, vibrant habitat. Um, and it, and it does have a difference with the invasives, you know, I could talk about invasives all the time, but with the invasives, sometimes it's like frustrating because you'll be on someone's land and they're like, they have a really bad invasive problem. And they're like, you're telling me to do something about it, but my neighbor's not going to do something about it. So why should I do something about it? And then you're like, well, but your neighbor is going to say he's not doing something about it because you're not doing something about it. So <laughs> with a lot of this stuff, I just feel like you got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. But then I would say, so that's small scale, but then all of these things need to be paired with advocacy, mm -hmm. right? Because to, you know, it's, it's important that we recognize that we all have impacts. Our choices have impacts on ecosystems. And, you know, we all own a little piece of this, but we also need to recognize that there are big scale things that we can do be policy, you know, and like um, in our communities and, and at a state level and at a national level, there are things that we can do that are much, much bigger that can really protect the things that are important to us. And so like in a community, um, you know, having a voice in the way that your community develops, you know, and, and trying to protect some of those remaining ecosystems and concentrate development, you know, and um, creating other policies that protect wildlife and that protect water quality and things like that uh, are really, really important. I think, um... What you're saying is totally true. Like my, I'm not going to do it if my neighbor doesn't do it. One of the funny things here in New Jersey is um, a little bit different than Vermont in that I think the ratio of like state-owned land in New Jersey versus privately owned land is pretty close to 50-50. Um, mm. I think the state owns slightly more land than the private side. So what I hear often is, as a forester, is why should I control barbarian on my property when the state right yeah. next door is doing nothing on their land to control barbar any invasive species vines whatever yeah. it might be so so it's you know i 
I appreciate you kind of encouraging people like like I, I'm always set an example, do it, do it right. And uh, yeah. maybe the, the state will catch on at some point and uh, and help us out here. So. Well, like we said, like we're not, you know, we're not going to we're not ever going to eradicate it. We're going to control it. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can have ownership over the invasives on your property and create an area where native plants can live and yeah. thrive you know, and advocate for that on other people's land as well. But sometimes that's, that's what we can do. There'll always be a Barbary out there throwing seeds all over the place, that's right. I know. <laughs> you know, and, and we'll just do what we can do. And when, and the idea, you know, is that, and when we see that when they sprout up, we'll know what they look like and we'll pull them out. Yeah. Well, that's great. I, uh, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. We had a lot of people also say thank you and that the presentation was really great. You had a lot of really positive feedback in the chat and then the Q&A as well. Uh, so thank you again, Ethan, for coming out or virtually coming out and doing this for us. It was a great talk. Um, Andy or Andy, any final words? Thank you all very good. Excellent conversation. And uh, Ethan, thank you very much. Uh, just a wonderful presentation. And, uh, uh, Kieran did uh, record it, so if anybody needs it, we will have it uh, recorded, but uh, just an excellent presentation. Thank you all very much. Thanks yep. for having me. Thanks, see Ethan. You, see you in New Jersey sometime, I hope. <laughs> Come on down. Thanks, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> have a great night. See you all later. Bye-bye. <laughs>